If Africa is going to become a member of the UN Security Council, a permanent member, they must have the full rights, just like the other five members, which means they must have veto power. Inviting Africa to the table and then asking them to remain mute is an insult not only to the African leaders, but it is an insult to 1.4 billion people. We appreciate what Ambassador Greenfield um, is saying. We appreciate the efforts she has made. But if she is going to complete this journey, this journey that has been going on for far too long, a journey that clearly exemplifies the continued disrespect of the African continent. Today we're talking with Adikana Chihombori Kwao, former ambassador of the African Union to the United States. Ambassador, it's terrific to have you back on our show. I want to start with a film clip of the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield. Let's listen. As it stands, there are currently three non-permanent seats on the Security Council allocated to African countries on a rotating basis for two years. The problem is these elected seats don't enable African countries to deliver the full benefit of their knowledge and voices to the work of the Council to consistently lead on the challenges that affect all of us and disproportionately affect Africa. That is why, in addition to non-permanent memberships for African countries, the United States supports creating two permanent seats for Africa on the Council. It's what our African partners seek, and we believe this is what is just. Ambassador Chihambori, let me ask you, on a scale of 1 to 10, how enthusiastic are you about the proposal that the ambassador has just made? I think it's a step in the right direction. However, keeping in mind that this issue has been on the table, ongoing for, like you said, 80 years. If we are going to right the wrong, why can't we just right this wrong once and for all? If Africa is going to become a member of the UN Security Council, a permanent member, they must have the full rights, just like the other five members, which means they must have veto power. Inviting Africa to the table and then asking them to remain mute is an insult not only to the African leaders, but it is an insult to 1.4 billion people. We appreciate what Ambassador Greenfield um, is saying. We appreciate the efforts she has made. But if she is going to complete this journey, this journey that has been going on for far too long, a journey that clearly exemplifies the continued disrespect of the African continent, Ambassador Greenfield must push for us to take this issue to the finish line. Africa must have two permanent seats at the UN Security Council with full veto power. Nothing less is acceptable. And I do believe that the United Nations, understanding how long this issue has been going on, how long the disrespect of the African continent has been going on, it is shameful that the United Nations would want to continue to blatantly disrespect the Africans by inviting them to the table, but then saying, sorry, you can't eat. You can only watch us play our games. You can watch us enjoy the 10-course meal. What a joke. What an insult. And I do hope that the African leaders are not going to accept it. Africa must be at the table as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, and the two seats must have veto power, plain and simple, period. Do you think Ambassador Thomas Greenfield doesn't understand this? Do you, do you think, what do you think is be behind this offer? When you said, hey, you appreciate the progress she's made, we do know that this was a promise or a commitment that President Joe Biden uh, is trying to fulfill before the end of his term, but do you think they, they, um, are not aware about how controversial it is to create permanent seats without votes? Of course they know what they're doing. 
<laughs> so, again, that's where the disrespect comes in. They know what they're doing. They know what the right thing to do is. No, we do not want to dilute our veto power if we give two more seats with veto power. No, we are simply saying the slice is big enough. The world is bigger than five countries representing over 7 billion people. We are simply saying serious wrongs have been perpetrated against black people. Here is an opportunity for President Biden to <coughs> right this wrong. This is an opportunity that we cannot miss. Africans must be at the table. 1.4 billion people must be represented. The continued disrespect of the Africans has got to come to an end. So we are asking President Biden and his running mate, Kamala Harris, who I hope will be the next president of the United States, they will right this wrong once and for all. And uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, we understand all the work that you have done. Please, as a sister, as an ambassador, we are asking you to take this issue to the finish line. Permanent positions on the UN Security Council with full veto power like the other five Ps. I've seen that China and Russia are enthusiastic and do support uh, Africa's position on the Security Council with two permanent seats, but I have not seen whether they would um, uh, actually agree to giving the veto to African countries as well. Your thoughts? Well, normally, like most issues pertaining to Africa, what I've found is that the United Nations usually, sorry, not the United Nations, the United States usually has the final say. If the United States is going to come in and say, we support fully Africa being on the UN Security Council with full veto power, I can assure you the other four members will follow suit. The United States, if the United States decides they do not wish for Africa to have veto power, it will not happen. But if the United States decides they do want Africa to have veto power, the other countries, I'm pretty sure, will follow suit. One of the things that Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the ambassador of the United States to the U.N., said um, about her resistance to giving more countries a veto on this is that it would make the council more dysfunctional. And it made me wonder whether any nation should have a veto power. Is there a model uh, in the future of the United Nations where we suspend veto power for all countries and we go to majority votes on key decisions? First of all, I find that, very, that comment very, very insulting. You are simply suggesting that the addition of two African countries is going to make the process dysfunctional. What an insult. If this particular situation, we are talking a country like Germany, if we're talking uh, any of the other Euro European countries joining as members uh, of the UN Security Council with veto power, would she still find it as a move that will introduce dysfunction? Or is it the introduction of two black African countries that is problematic? What really makes it very sad is that the voices are coming out of the mouth of a black woman. The voice, those words are coming out of the mouth of an African-American who must understand certain language cannot be used, particularly when we're talking about uh, the international platform. To suggest that introducing two African countries will introduce dysfunction, it is sad, it is disrespectful, and it will not be tolerated. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield really needs to retract those words, and she needs to explain herself to say, what do you mean, dysfunction? Exactly how are the two African countries going to introduce dysfunction? Unless, of course, the entity has already been dysfunctional, which, in my, in my opinion, is the case, and that is what really is the problem with the United Nations. It's a dysfunctional entity. It is a, a toothless bulldog, and they need to do what they are mandated to do by the world. So, yes, no, Africa is not going to introduce any dysfunction at the United Nations. The entity itself has been dysfunctional. Maybe an addition of two African countries might straighten it up and create some normalcy and for a change have an entity that's going to truly represent people of the world. As it is right now, it is a relationship. It, it is an entity that was designed to steal from the developing nations. It is an entity whose entire purpose and plan and reason for being created was to, 
to steal from developing nations. So let's be clear. If we are going to speak truth to power, the UN Security Council has been dysfunctional, remains dysfunctional, until it is an entity that truly represents the whole world. At this point, the UN Security Council does not represent the world. So yes, they should be ashamed. It is a dysfunctional uh, uh, entity that maybe the inclusion of other nations might actually make it less dysfunctional. Let me ask you to, to respond to uh, Martin Kimani, who is the former Kenyan ambassador to the United Nations, and he writes, how does having one or two African countries with veto power further collective African interests? By the time Africa tears itself apart politically to choose those two countries, a fight that will be egged on by global powers, we will end up with deep division, possibly in perpetuity. UNSC reform must be preceded by major African Union reform. Your thoughts and reaction to that, Ambassador Chihombori? With all due respect, I disagree with the brother uh, severely. Africa must be at the table. We must be where decisions are being made. We must be in a position to also disagree or agree on global issues. Yes, while I understand the dysfunction among us, as Africans at the African Union. And I've always said this, that at this point, we don't have the right leadership at the African Union. And I'm hoping that with the new elections that are coming up in uh, February of next year, we are going to have an African Union chair with a head over their shoulders. Right now, we don't have any leadership at the African Union. Musa Faki has failed us. He's a puppet of the West. We all know that. So, yes, I agree with him on one end that we do need reform at the African Union. The good thing for us is there are elections coming up. Musa Faki is going to be gone. And our hope is we are going to have uh, a new chairman of the African Union who understands the issues and is going to reform the African Union where it can truly represent the people. That is where we need. We cut our own homework to do. But that doesn't mean we should give out an, an opportunity to be at the table. So to just run off and say, well, we are dysfunctional at the African Union, and therefore we are not going to, to demand that seat at the, uh, at the United Nations uh, uh, Security Council, that's actually stupid. We need to be there while we continue to reform our African Union, while we continue to work together. And I can tell you, the African leaders, they work together. The issue is, do we have someone at the African Union who can implement and execute the wishes of the African Union? They have a system, even for choosing the chairman of the African Union. It's on a rotational basis. I don't see the African leaders having any problem deciding which two countries are going to be the first ones. They just use the same rotational process. Right. So, no, I disagree with that, Ambassador. Uh, seriously, we need to be at the table. But more importantly, I am so glad that Musa Faki is leaving and I'm hoping that the next chairman of the African Union, come February, is going to be a Pan-African who is going to stand up, defend Africa, and represent the continent like we must be represented. We right. demand that, and I'm hoping that we'll get that come February. If the United Nations and the Permanent Five are more and more anachronistic, more disconnected from the way power is distributed in the world, and, you know, we haven't even begun talking about India or Brazil or other major states and their roles in the Security Council, aren't there going to develop ways that you can get around the U.N., that Africa can have voice and power in other ways? Why does this debate about the Permanent Five matter so much? Well, it matters in the sense that there needs to be true representation at the United Nations. The United Nations is not about five countries. The United Nations is about all countries of the world. As a matter of fact, the United Nations should have undergone reform a long time ago. So the issue is about having an entity like the United Nations that is controlled by five countries where the other countries have no voice, where the other countries, the five countries can just veto anything they don't like. I mean, it is so unfair. The fact that in 2024 we are still discussing this, it's, it's, it's just crazy. That just goes to underscore how insane our world is. So, yes, what you're going to see is the global South coming together. That is this, is this kind of behavior uh, that is leading to uh, the formation of the BRICS. 
the global world say, the global south say, we have been asking for equity. We have been asking and demanding equality and true representation at the global stage, at every level, be it at the United Nations, be it in the financial systems, be it with World Trade Organizations, World Health Organizations. The global South countries are constantly being trumped on. And so it's going to lead to another system that's going to be created where the rest of the world is going to say enough is enough. We're tired of your entities that are not representing us. So to the United Nations and the rest of the Western world, uh, particularly the, the, um, the five nations on the Permanent Security Council, they also need to see the writing on the wall and realize that the world is changing. The world is more aware of the geopolitics and what's really going on. And many voices are speaking out at, as to the wrongs that must be righted. So the sooner they address this issue, the better of the world is going to be. This abusive situation where um, less developed countries are being taken advantage of uh, and being dictated to, that is not going to continue to work anymore. And the P5 nations must see the writing on the wall and do the right thing, starting with Africa and then other countries like India, Brazil, they too need to be on, they need to be represented because mm. they are representing uh, millions of people. So you can't just have 1.4 million people in India being voiceless. So yes, after Africa, we must bring India. <laughs> That's it. That would be my suggestion. <laughs> and slowly get more countries. Right now, the United Nations, as it stands, it does not represent the world. They're just using other countries to come to the United Nations so they can say, present, say, yes, we were there. You know, it is actually, I have been saying this for years, that if I could... Uh, influence the African leaders in any way, shape, or form. They need to boycott attending the, the United Nations General Assembly. There's nothing there for them. They're just coming there to validate other people's issues. So if Africa was to really speak with one voice, they need to boycott the, uh, the United Nations General Assembly. There's nothing there for, their, for them. They're just wasting taxpayers' money, having uh, right. hundreds of them coming to the United Nations. For what? You know? Don't come to the United Nations. Tell the United Nations, if you don't fix this, if we're not members of the UN Security Council, we're not attending UNGA. Plain and simple. But unfortunately, they're not going to do it. You know, Africa needs to have a backbone. Africa needs to have right. a backbone. Well, you know, you've been working for a very long time, and, you know, since we've known each other, to really unite Africans, their purpose, their sense of identity, and to end and diminish uh, foreign control and dominance of African states. And I guess my question to you in this moment, and when again you're, you're on the same mission, what's getting in the way? What's getting in the way of the Atacana Chihombori mission to end dominance of Africa, to empower Africans and unite Africans? I think one of the biggest problems and challenges that we have, I often say as black people, not only black people in Africa, but black people around the world, we were defeated where it matters the most, which is the mind. I am going to say this honestly and sincerely, and some people may not like it, but it is our reality. We have African governments that have some members of the governments who are on the payrolls of foreign nations. We have Africans who are willing to be influenced, to be bought, to be paid in order to derail not only the continental agenda, but also agendas of their own country's development. You tell me why is it that we have ministers of finance who come to Washington twice a year to discuss issues to do with funding uh, for, uh, for Africa, financial issues for Africa, why haven't they come together and taken a position to truly challenge the World Bank and say, these loans that you continue to make us pay have been paid for gazillion times. Mm. They were illegally acquired. Um, I'm encouraging everybody to read the book Confessions of the Economic Hitmen, where they talk about exactly how they would force these countries to accept these humongous loans. It was all a game at the expense of the mm. African people. Our people know that. But why aren't they standing up and pushing back and uh, calling a spade a spade? One, we have some that are on the payrolls of foreign governments, and yet they are in the government themselves. Shame on them. Two, we have some that are just scared of those who don't look like us, again, is part of the legacy of colonization, 
and the legacy of slavery. Mm. We have some serious healing to do as Africans when it comes to our minds. No other man on earth in any leadership position would tolerate the abuse the Africans are tolerating, blatant abuse. So our bigger issue is the mind, our inability to fight back, our men standing up and being men like other men around the world. A lot of it has to do with some on an individual basis, greed, others, it's just the mind. We're afraid of white people. We don't want to speak up in meetings because we're afraid we'll be labeled. It's, it's the mind at the end of the day for me it is the right. mind that was defeated. And until the mind is awoken and the mind is fearless and the mind, mind simply says what's right is right, what is wrong is wrong, come to the United Nations, challenge the United Nations. Go to the World Bank, challenge the World Bank with facts and knowledge of what is really going on. Call these nations out. Tell them to stop the abuse which is blatant. These nations are not trying to hide the abuse. The abuse is blatant. So to the Africans, I say, stand up, have a backbone, speak up. And for those in power, people appointed you into positions so you can represent the people. And to the people, I say to the Africans, right. if a leader is not representing you well, vote them out. <laughs> we are sick and tired of being misrepresented by our leadership. Vote them out if they don't represent you well at a community level in your country. Vote them out if they are not representing you well at the world stage. They know the facts. Our people are now empowered. They know the games that are being played by the Western world, by the Eastern world. They are telling their leadership, we don't want it anymore. So we are demanding leadership that's going to defend us, leadership that's going to speak up. Leadership that's going to say, do unto us as you want done unto you. Our ask as Africans is a very simple one. We want the world to treat us the way they would want to be treated. And our leaderships, our leaders are our mouthpiece. We expect them to speak up. We expect them to defend us by any means necessary. What we need are leaders that are awoken, fearless, and are ready to defend Africa like they were mandated to do by the people.